Welcome to this episode of Cover to Cover. I'm Joanne Joseph. Great to be back with you. And today we're tackling the fun theme made for TV. So many brilliant books have been turned into just as excellent films and series. Others haven't quite worked so well in translation. But what is it that determines which books made for good TV or film? And what's the process that goes into converting them from one medium into another successfully? Well, I've got two excellent guests with me today to explore exactly this. Bongi Wesilane is an award winning film producer. Jack Devnarayan is a well-loved actor and activist within his industry. Welcome to you both. Great to have you with me this Thank morning. You. Thank you so much for being with me. So, Bongiwe, uh, I'm so excited for you because the latest news that broke very recently is that um, we know you've done happiness is a four-letter word. We know it was a huge success and now you're working on a sequel. I am. I'm very excited about it. It's titled Happiness Ever After. Um, it's not based on the book, so yeah. we've just kind of really reimagined the, um, the journey of these amazing characters uh, five years later. So, so I'm going to, to drill down a little bit deeper into that in a moment, but tell me, take me back to the making of the first film, Happiness is a Four Letter Word, a and just explain to me th that moment when you and, and, and the writers you were working with and others who put this project together realized this was going to be material for a great movie. Yeah, uh, I mean, at the time I used, I worked for Mnet, mm -hmm. so they had uh, um, the Literary Awards. I don't know if you remember, Mnet used to run the, the Mnet Literary Awards. Yes, yes, I do. And uh, Happiness is a Four Letter Word was the book that won the prize for Best Suited for Adaptation. Um, and I was on the panel, I, was, I read most of the books that year, and I really was excited about it. I thought, what an amazing, um, book to you know for potential to be turned into a, a film mm -hmm. I, I I loved it I recognized the girls I recognized myself in the girls I know that a lot of my friends really um, resonated with it yeah. um, and you know at the time you know when I went to my executives at Mnet I said we should make this into a film and they said well no, we you should give it to a producer to do it. Yeah. And I literally made a decision to leave my job wow. <laughs> to go and make this film. So, so this book has actually done quite a lot in yes, your life. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, I hadn't produced anything at the time. Like I said, I used to work for a broadcaster. And I approached uh, Junaid Ahmed, the late Junaid Ahmed, who's a, a, um, a producer based in KZN, and Helena Spring. They had been awarded the an NVF feature film slate. Um, and I went to them and I said, I want to be, you know, I want to make this film. Is it something that you would consider? So I was invited to pitch. So literally I showed up with a book and uh, a two page kind of pitch motivation with me talking to a panel. And it was one of the, the projects that was selected. Um, they selected, I think the three films that came out of that slate was Hard to Get. Yeah. That was directed by Zin Tuli. Right. Happiness is a four letter word and Keeping Up with the Kandasamis. Oh, of yeah. course. Okay. And yeah, those, those have all much. become really successful commercial Absolutely, films as well, yeah. haven't they? So, so tell me, you, you've also got, you've got so many projects on the go at the moment, but the other one I want to talk about is Coconut, right? This great book by Kobanu Matra, um, who, who is a doctor and, and I think published around 2007, am I right? Yeah, 2005 it oh, came 2005 out. 2005 actually. Yes, yeah. and, and tell me a bit, I, I mean, you and, and Dineo Lusenga have interviewed yeah. your, your partner Absolutely, in crime yeah. and, um, and she told me first about the adaptation of this book. So how far are you with turning that into so a So we, we've kind of, I mean, we, the, um, how can I say it, we're in treatment stage. Right. Uh, basically we've got a, 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 a really strong treatment that we are now moving on to like a beat sheet, what we call a step outline. Yeah. Um, hopefully we'll have a script because the option expires in November so by then we want to have a financeable script. I'm working with uh, Palisa Shongwe who's writing, adapting yeah. and Tracy Lee Rayner who's our script consultant, script editor, very strong writers um, and uh, you know it's, it's been a very interesting process with Coconut because it's not, you know, it's a very different book in a way because it's not like a you know, there's not one story arc. It's really based on these veneers of experiences by different characters. Yeah. So basically deciding on a plot for it, um, a beginning and a middle and an end was, uh, it took long, yeah. but I'm very happy with where we're going with it right now. Fantastic. Yeah. I think it's so exciting what you've got on the boil. 
Jack, you're the guy who gets the script, you receive mm. it, you, you, you have to process the script as an actor and decide how exactly you, you're going to, to, um, to portray your character, for example, in this. In, in a case like this, when you get a script uh, that's based on a, a novel, do you go back to the original novel? Do you work strictly with the script, um, you know, so, so, as to, so as to simply decide which intention, the scriptwriter's intention or the author's intention it is you're going to follow? Every actor would have a different approach. Yeah. I want to, to draw in as much information as I possibly can. So I would go to the original work right. and I would go through the novel and look through the history, the origins, the setup, the intangibles, you know, mm -hmm. um, where do these people come from? What drove them? What motivated them? Yeah. Um, what scared and confused them? And to carry that with me into the reading of the script, because in adapting, yeah. something for screenplay and Bongiwa would know this more than anybody you have to make compromises mm. you cannot possibly include the full rich tapestry of the entire novel into a screenplay and in fact it, firstly you're, you're changing the medium in which the story is being told right. so as much as you might be losing a lot of things you also want to optimize its visual impact because you're now going to film or television right. so in that process I would then see the full context that my character then features in yeah. terms of that story. So the character has an important purpose yeah. and I'll be able to figure out the purpose of the character by drawing in the information from the novel then to the screenplay and then I'll be able to use that as my background when working out the specific character's motivations. So, so tell me what for you as an actor is, is good material that can easily be turned into film. When you're reading a book, do you think, do you often think to yourself, oh, well, look, here's Behind Her Eyes by Sarah Pinbro. That'll make a good series for Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I look at the cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I think it's, you, you will find the clues along the way as you're mm. reading through and you will, you will start to visualize. And I always find a real test of excellent writing is whether the images can conjure themselves into your imagination easier than others. Mm. So yeah. it might also be your own background. You know, you might come from a certain place in KZN that's, you know, full of sugarcane and beautiful hills and the seaside. And if somebody's writing about that, you immediately have a point of reference to say, I know that. I know that place. Mm. I can visualize it in my head. So it's one of the tools that an actor needs as and is, as an essential part of their toolkit is a rich visual imagination. You've got to take something and turn it into pictures in your head and not just turn it into pictures, but you've got to believe those pictures yeah. and you've got to live within those pictures. And for me, what I, would, what I would do is try to absorb and translate the words that are coming off the page into a visual language. Mm. And if that happens really easily, then I know this is a story that can be translated into a screenplay really well. And I can tell the story then of that character within the bigger, the bigger story. Yeah, you, you've often heard this say, said, Bongi, I'm sure, um, you know, the, the film wasn't as good as the book. Yes. Is, is, that, is that a fair, is that fair commentary? Is, is that fair criticism? Absolutely. Do you think? I mean, I think if anybody has engaged with the book and then they go to a film after that or, you know, the, it's, it's, it's not always the same. And you mm. do get like people say, like, it's not, it's not the same or it's weaker or there's certain, because when, when you read a book, there's so much into it. But yeah, when yeah. you, when it's translated to a visual medium, there's a lot of creative liberties that are you know that come into play that we as creatives and producers and actors take so it's it's just one of those things i know that like i mentioned to you earlier that i always when people when i tell people that the film is based on a book and they say oh i've never read the book i'm kind of sometimes discourage them <laughs> from reading the book because it's so different you know it's yeah. it's it's just one of those things it is yeah. because it's the process of literally turning it into a visual medium yeah. there's a lot of um uh, uh, con like thought into a book you know characters mm. think and how do you translate a thought yes. into a book you yes, know i think yes. the important things are the themes that come into play that you have to um you know thematically i think it's the same as the book yeah. um 
and and also deciding on a genre as mm -hmm. well of yeah. you know happen I think that uh, the novel itself might hit a lot more on being a, a dramatic Yes. Whereas the You're film is a happiness is a four letter, four -letter word. word. Yes. Cynthia's writing yeah. of it was that it was a drama based yeah. on these women and their experiences, but we decided to go the rom com route, the romantic comedy right. route, by kind of elevating the male characters into yeah. more kind of romantic leads yes. rather than the more dramatic and serious and hard. Yeah. Um, uh, characters that they are in the book. Well, I, I think that all talks to interpretation as well, and that's such an important aspect of this because there are books that have been transitioned fairly well from one medium to another, and one of them has to be Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale. So we asked analyst Angelo Fick, who is an, an Atwood fanatic, what he thought of the multiple makings of that book. Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale has been adapted successfully several times, most notably in the film version by Volker Schlondorf with Natasha Richardson, Faye Dunaway and Robert Duvall, among others. The film, I thought, was successful in its vision of Atwood's dystopia, even though, as Atwood has pointed out, it had a compromised ending. Uh, what we then saw was the adaptation for the theatre, uh, also in opera um, and as a graphic novel. What most people will remember now is the Hulu adaptation for television, um, which coincided with the Trump presidency. As an adaptation, I thought the Hulu TV series was successful in the first and second series, uh, precisely because it remained so faithful to the vision and artistic endeavor of Atwood's uh, mid-1980s novel. Uh, in season three, it departed from that to fill in the gap between uh, the end of the testimony Atwood gives um, for Offred in the novel and the historical notes, which is the academic conference some few hundred years later, which looks back at Gilead as an historical phenomenon. Uh, what we've since seen is the emergence of a sequel from Atwood herself in the Testaments, and it seems the television series is trying to catch up in that gap between how Offred uh, is imprisoned in Gilead and how, in the end, Gilead falls. Um, Bruce Miller has, as the showrunner promised, us several seasons. He says there is mat material enough for it. Um, but one imagines that the further they move away from The Handmaid's Tale and towards uh, the world inhabited by uh, the Testaments, uh, the less likely those of us who are committed to Atwood's original novel and its sequel are likely to find the, the television series as compelling as, as we did the first two seasons. So that was what Angelo had to share with us about his various readings of all those films and, of course, the series that was more recently made uh, featuring that Margaret Atwood book. Now, we know that Atwood consulted widely on the Hulu series, although some of the details were changed. I'm just curious to know, Bungi and Jack, what did you think of that adaptation? Bungi? The I Handmaid's actually, Tale. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was really ha hard TV, mm -hmm. very gripping, yeah. uh, very... Um, different you know it was a, a, a very different series that was kind of wow um, I did watch the first uh, season yeah. I loved it I loved the treatment I loved the you know the writing it was really um, amazing but it was also very dark yeah. <laughs> and so I really couldn't sit through the second <laughs> yeah. season because I thought oh, could could this get any worse <laughs> You know, yeah. Well, they, they were, Jack, they were living through the Trump administration at that time, so anything yes. was possible, I think, within yes, that context. Although, you know, and I didn't read the book, but yeah. I, I went through maybe an episode and a half before I really felt as if the story is like a car trying to drive with its handbrake on. Mm. And it was, uh, you know, it, it presented a kind of dystopian reality that for mm. me was so alien. Yeah. Um, and I, I could I could get the themes in it, and I understood why these were important and why the story needed to be told. But it, for me, I couldn't get into it, and I wasn't going to try. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. At least you're honest. <laughs> then, then there are obviously the classics, right? Going back a bit, you've got Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. That that was adapted. Uh, it was such a such a hit actually globally. Um, Peter Jackson was behind that, and we actually asked uh, Philip Awira, uh, who to send us a little clip all the way from Canada as to what he thought of that adaptation. The Lord of the Rings were the first series of books that I'd ever seen adapted into movies in a more serious way. So back in the 1990s when they adapted books into movies, they would make it 90 minutes or two hours and leave out a lot of details. But the Lord of the Rings is the first one where they went to so much detail, where every single book 
was three hours long plus. So they put in so much, especially in the Fellowship of the Rings, the Two Towers and the Return of the King. Now, even though they put in so much, there was a lot left out. However, I appreciated the amount of detail that went into the books and it was so enjoyable. In fact, Peter Jackson did such an amazing job that many of the things that he described were much better than I imagined. For example, some scenes involving the Balrog and Gandalf in the caves. That was really, really good. The Smeagol turning to Golem, that was done in a way that I could not imagine. So for me, up until now, the Lord of the Rings are still the best books that have been adapted into film. Well, thanks very much for that, Philip. And of course, another series of films which enchanted viewers, young and old, was the Harry Potter series. Celeste Phillips, who's mad about Harry Potter, told us whether the films really did justice to the books. So the Harry Potter books made for TV or made for the movies. I loved the movies. Whatever I imagined when I read the books, um, which was more than almost 20 years ago, um, was the movies just brought it to life. It was so cool, like the Quidditch matches and Hogwarts and the changing staircases and um, like Sirius Black changing from Sirius into a dog, a dog into Sirius. I just, I thought it was so well made. Um, it probably helped that J.K. Rowling was involved in almost all the aspects of the movie, so she was on set and she, what was in her imagination, came to light on screen, which I loved. Um, obviously, the books are more detailed, um, something that my daughter's a bit disappointed in because she watched um, a couple of the movies. She hasn't watched the, the later ones, which, are, which get um, decidedly darker. So she hasn't watched those yet. But like the Philosopher's Stone, for example, she's reading the book now the first um, book. So she said, Mom, the detail in the book is so much more than the movie. And I said, well, that's um, the way it works, is that that's why you should first read the books and then watch the movies, which is the ideal thing. Um, but I loved it. It was very well made. Um, and yeah, I look forward to what else J.K. Rowling will come up with. All right, so we have uh, two people who are not just industry players, but parents as well. What did your kids think of Harry Potter? Did they read them and watch the films, Jack? No, they, mm -hmm. I, it was entertaining as a movie because my kids at that time were of an age where, um, you know, watching TV and, and movies was the way entertainment was happening in the house. Oh, right. And, you know, I was happy to indulge that because it was entertaining for me too. Yeah. And at a certain point, I think the as the series progressed and went down, the long chain of books that came out of uh, out of that that genre, it, it it eventually started to me. It felt like it was taking itself far too seriously, mm. and losing itself down certain parts and certain characters that I thought were entirely self-serving. And so I was happy to 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 accept that my kids enjoyed what they saw for that time, and then other things took its place. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's interesting because uh, some people embraced that whole Harry Potter phenomenon and some just Absolutely. didn't. Bongi? Yeah, I mean, I think, I'm not sure if my kids read the books, but they did watch the movies and not maybe right up to the third one. I'm not sure they sat through all of them. Yeah. Um, I know that my young son did read the spad books, oh, yeah. but that was because he's boarding school, just kind mm. of that experience. Yeah. Um, and there's another series of books that he really read, The Wimpy Kids. Oh yes, uh, Diary of a Wimpy Diary Kid. That was a super kids. popular one. Yes, and, and I think they, so. yeah, I think they yeah. adapted some of them. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so uh, Jack, how did you feel about that? The Spud series or Diary of a Wimpy Kid? Yes, I, I was. I, I read the, uh, the Diary of a Wimpy Kid. That was a wonderful series. <laughs> <laughs> I had a bit of fun with it too. Yeah. And, um, for me, it was wonderful because a lot of my friends were involved in the production, and it oh. excited me that for the first one, John Cleese arrived on our shores and yes. you know delivered an exceptional performance as he does did an excellent job. yes yeah. and of course my good friend john barker who directed me in 31 million reasons mm. in itself adapted from a book uh, directed spud 3 so there are all these various connections going on in in the translations but one of my very earliest experiences in reading a novel that eventually or i imagine by the time i read the book it was already a movie uh, was papillon Oh. with Henri Sharia, who experienced living in a penal colony and 
I was, at, I was in Standard 5 at the time reading this harrowing tale of this man who was serving time for you know, all kinds of criminal offences and reading about the reality within a, a prison environment and of course the breakout mm. and what it meant. And what a surprise I had years later when I found that Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman were in this movie that brought this entire thing to life on screen. And at that stage, I was so attached to the characters in, in the book yeah. that I didn't want to watch the movie. <laughs> I thought, no, I don't, want, I don't want anything to spoil what I felt in the, in the book. Yeah. So it, uh, you know, it, it reminded me again how these, these real stories can be captured with such incredible richness and authenticity. Yeah, and sometimes yeah. you, you don't want to spoil that experience by seeing its rendition on screen. That's true. But, but this, this issue of interpretation keeps coming in, right, um, Bongi? Because, of course, uh, I, I think we're all bringing interpretation to these books anyway. I, I think of Bridgerton, for example. I mean, Bridgerton is just unbelievably popular. I'm going to just reach out of shot here for a moment. And this is actually the one, the first one that the, the series was based on. It's actually called The Duke and I. I didn't realize until Jonathan Ball um, arrived at my house with a box full of Bridgerton books. I didn't realize how many there were actually yeah, in the know, series. Yeah. It's pretty incredible. So lots more to come from that point of view. But it's interesting, the choices that Shonda Rhimes made in that, uh, in that film. And, and I just want to quote something that an, an academic, Shireen Hassam, had to say about it. I mean, it, it, it was interesting to her that, that many of the characters, unlike in the book, uh, were black characters, cast as black characters in the actual Shonda Rhimes series. And, and she talks about uh, she talks about the phenomenon of putting those black characters in a space where much of the wealth of that time would have been uh, would have been built on the back of slavery and we never actually get to see what the what the reaction of those black characters is to that dilemma jack how what did you think about that choice it's a tough one you know i think i know that it's become a very very popular series and i think there's probably more support and interest then there is criticism. Yeah. So I'm, I'm prepared to take a non-judgmental stance on this right now. <laughs> How virtuous. <laughs> yes, it's, you know, I'm, I'm being generous as a, as a critic. Uh, I, I do have so, uh, some suspicions about uh, the effort. I think there is a contrivance here that I'm, I'm uncomfortable with, mm -hmm. but I haven't been able to put to exact words what it is I feel is wrong about it, if anything. So I'm, I've, I've decided to suspend my judgment until I know more. So, so should we, Bongi, how should we read that? I mean, clearly we can read the books easily because we understand that setting and, and the characters in it. But how should we read the film? Do we read it as fantasy in order to accept Absolutely. it? How do yeah, we do I think that? it should be read as just pure entertainment, pure fantasy, pure reimagination of this world. Mm. Um, and it's, it's very interesting choices that uh, Producers make. I know yeah. Shonda Rhimes was involved, and in a way, for me, it feels like if someone had read the book *Happiness Is a Four-Letter Word*, they probably would never have imagined us casting Kanye Bao. Oh, Do you right. know what I mean? Yes, it's, I yes. think it's it's a kind of a similar, maybe not so much with the Bridgerton model, but it's those kind of choices that you make that probably have nothing to do with the story, but have a lot to do with the marketability. Ah, of the right. series yes and where it's going to sit you know and how you're going to um, uh, publicize it you know what are those things that you're going to use to sell to sell it um, and 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 you know it's it's those kind of creative liberties that we producers um, take and creatives take on it um, but speaking specifically on Bridgerton, it is jarring. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's as <laughs> fantastical as it is and as beautiful as the main lead, the Duke was. You can't help think, where did he come from? <laughs> yes, you yes, know? yes, what is his history? <laughs> yeah, where did he yeah. come from? Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's, that's fair enough. Yeah. Jack, I gave you a hard one to read, Hillbilly Elegy. And, and that is nowhere near as pleasant as the world of Bridgerton. I mean, it, it takes you to some, some really dark places in yeah. terms of, of its setting in the United States. Yeah, a, a story that we don't often get to see or hear. Yeah. But it's something that the author, J.D. Vance, uh, is able to, to detail with such honesty and such an openness. And you realize that 
he might not feel, and he actually says in his introduction, you know, I don't see myself doing anything extraordinary. Mm -hmm. My journey, you know, to come out of this community uh, that's, that's riddled with um, emotional trauma, the, the, the sense of being disaffected workers, um, you know, this hard, gritty working class people that feel disconnected from the economy that they are serving. Um, the emotional and physical trauma of families falling apart and the social decay that they're experiencing. And he says that he's come out of that and found his way through a journey of success into, you know, um, through an Ivy League college. And he says that in itself is not the extraordinary story. He says, it is the fact that I have done the ordinary thing is what is incredible. And I, I realize that's so true because you have certain circumstances described in this book. Um, the, this, this ethnic grouping of Scots-Irish people living in Ohio that formed the group called the Hillbillies <laughs> um, create a milieu that is it's so difficult to break out of. And yet, if you remain within it, it will kill you. It will destroy you. It will break your spirit and you will become its victim unless you find a way out. And he has. Mm -hmm. So that the story that tracks this journey with such honesty is what was hard about it is that these characters and these situations in this, these broken families are so familiar to all of us. Yeah. Yeah. We see it in, in, you know, in, in the impoverished parts of Chatsworth and Phoenix, where we are from, yeah. you know, in KZN. And we see it in, you know, in, in Chesterville, which lies right next door to Chatsworth and all that. And it's so we know these people, we know the situations. And this is what makes it so engaging. I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I just you're going to add to that point. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the one thing about just even just picking up a book and deciding whether it's going to make great uh, film or great television is, is you talking about resonance, you know, yeah. that it could be said anyway. Yeah. But if the characters touch you and speak to you in a different space or a different um, world, you know, and, and I think that's the thing that's very important in, in, in what we do is recognizing resonance in in it and how that can you know a story can touch people differently yeah yeah, yeah. you know uh, uh, Eusebius MacKaiser my co-host was was a little critical of of the turning of, or the the techniques that have been used to turn that, that I saw into, his video clip did yes, you well yes. let's take a quick look at it Jack sure. Hillbilly Elegy the film was quite disappointing I thought the acting was really 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 poor and I made the mistake of already having read the book which was absolutely brilliant I think if you haven't read the book, the film will be okay. It is almost a compelling account of a working class white family in America. But the problem is that the book is so much more sophisticated. I loved the book because the book was like a very popular, readable, textured sociology of why so many white working class Americans vote Republican. They feel alienated from mainstream politics and the author J.D. Vance's own family, Hillbillies, understood what it is like, like black people, to feel on the margins of society. So if you read the book, you really understand working class politics in relation to republicanism. And all of that is lost in the film because the film was simple and the acting wasn't very good. What do you think, Jack? Was Eusebius fair in his criticism? <laughs> I am going to make him an actor. I know he's had a brief stint recently. <laughs> 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 but I, I think we need to take him through the journey that these actors had to go. And I, you know, I think he offers fair comment on everything. But um, my concern was when he isolated the acting as wasn't up to the standard that he enjoyed. And I think for me, that was one of the, the, the bravest efforts that I've seen on screen. Um, looking at Glenn Close and, uh, and the character she created, because um, you know, even according to the author, J.D. Vance, he, he holds his grandmother, Maman. Yeah. Um, he holds her as the single most powerful force that got him to take responsibility and claim agency over his own life. Mm -hmm. And that, that takes a rare kind of strength. 
And I was, I was absolutely blown away by how Glenn Close was able to present that in her hard-bitten way. Um, she's a rough woman who's come through a lot of hardship in her life. And to see hope in the children that she has around her and to inspire them to grow out of the circumstances that she knows she is herself trapped by. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, um, you had Amy Adams who, who presented that, you know, pretty as a doll and yet deeply flawed. Um, there was another character that, was, that, that came to life in such an incredible way that your heart broke for her and yet every time she slipped out, you know, slipped out giving in to her, her addiction and giving in to the, the games, the, 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 the relationships and love affairs that she fell in and out of constantly. Okay, okay. Well, can I give you the last word on this? Because you are so engaged in this process of taking new writing, relatively new South African writing, and turning it into film. Tell me about some of the exciting stuff that you hope is going to happen in terms of this in the near future. Well, I mean, I think for me, it's, you know, we have such a rich history of literature in this country. And, and of course, people are not reading as much as they used to. Why not take those books and turn them into movies? But it is, it is actually the first turning point for me um, when, I, when, I, um, when I'm looking for work. I know a lot of people send me scripts and things like that. But knowing that there's been a journey with the book, it, it, it just makes more kind of a, a, um, an exciting kind of development process. So I'm, I'm always excited about that. I am actually always on the lookout. I've just kind of also optioned a series of romance novels. So hopefully <laughs> they'll be the next Bridgerton. <laughs> but, yes, yes. <laughs> but it is really, and we, you know, we have a, a really rich history of, of literature and we, we need to start digging into that as producers. I mean, I think Hollywood is made out of, you know, um, films that have been based on. Yeah, yeah. good point. Yeah. Well, Yume, thank you so much for being with us today. Jack, great to have you as well. Thank and, you. and thank you for, for helping us mine this, this topic and really understand this relation between books and, and, and movies. And, and also for giving us a sense that we should be doing more of this. Keep writing. If you're a writer out there, this could be the end, uh, end product of your process. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for everyone, to everyone who contributed to this show. It's really been a fun one. Uh, and remember, all the books we talked about are available at Ex exclusive books so that you can either walk into an exclusive book store or you can go to the online store www.exclusivebooks.co.za thank you keep uh, watching but especially keep reading take care bye bye